today in the Pilot Lounge, we have Ryan Campbell. He is 26 years old and he uh, finished a solo trip around the world at 19 and previously held the record for doing so. Uh, thank you, Ryan, so much for joining us today. Hey, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Um, so we can tell, obviously, you are from Australia and you've moved to the U.S. How is life treating you right now? Uh, that's a wild question this year, uh, a loaded question. It's it's good. Uh, I specifically uh, sold everything in Australia that I owned except a little Piper Cub and I shipped the aeroplane and myself to the US and I'm now based in the Nashville area and uh, I moved here specifically to start a business as a professional speaker uh, to take my Australian speaking and, and spread it into this market. And um, it's been an incredible adventure, uh, not just from a work point of view, but from a a flying point of view to have the airplane over here and to uh, live the dream, the YouTube dream that we seem to have uh, watched for so long at home to, uh, you know, fly to Oshkosh, fly to High Sierra, do all these incredible things whilst living uh, in the US. So super fun place to live. I absolutely love it, uh, even in this wild year. Um, so how did you originally get involved in aviation? Uh, I was six years old and I had two older brothers and a a mum that was a stay-at-home mum, a dad that was the local milkman. And uh, we had an opportunity. It was a very long story, but we were given an opportunity to go on our first ever overseas trip. First trip, not just for myself and my brothers, but for my mum and dad as well. So uh, we jumped onto a Boeing 737, took off out of uh, Sydney Airport and headed for an island in the Pacific Ocean called Vanuatu. And it was that flight, that moment of taking off out of uh, Sydney uh, pointing over the Pacific Ocean, just all of the sensory uh, overload moments for a young kid, you know, being pushed back in the seat, uh, looking out that window, you know, down at the city, uh, blown away by the size of the city, uh, but uh, absolutely mesmerised by the fact you could fly through clouds. It was that day, uh, especially being invited to the cockpit prior to September 11 to, you know, meet the pilots and look at the buttons and the switches. It was that day that allowed me to discover my passion. And, I think I'm very lucky to have done that at such a young age. It, it wasn't a matter of if I would fly from that point on. It was uh, just a matter of when. And it honestly never left my head. So one day at six years old uh, changed everything. And, and how soon did you start flying after that? I actually grew up in a family unbeknown to me that had aviation ties. My uncle was a commercial pilot. Uh, my long lost distant cousin was... Uh, the flight instructor who actually eventually, you know, be my flying instructor. Uh, my granddad who had passed away had been a pilot. So I had aviation ties, but I was unaware of that, you know, when I was young. As I grew older, common sense kind of said to me, hey, you know, you can learn to fly, but you're going to have to have a job because it's expensive and you're going to have to at least be allowed to drive a car first because that should be the order of operations, drive a car, fly a plane. And... Again, that all changed in, in one moment. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I, I sat down, I read the local newspaper for some reason at 14, and I remember skimming through it and seeing a picture of a kid in an aeroplane. And the article was all about how he'd flown this light sport aircraft solo for the very first time on the day that he turned 15, his 15th birthday. And I was envious, I was jealous, I was blown away that that was even legal. And I read that article over and over again honestly replacing his name with mine, just dreaming, just envious. I found a couple of after-school jobs, weekend jobs. I started to fund uh, one flying lesson every two weeks. And I set the goal that I wanted to fly solo on my 15th birthday. Um, I managed to make that happen. And then it kind of not only proved to me what I could do if I really set my mind, you know, to a certain goal and, and worked hard, but it made me want to do everything I possibly could within aviation at the youngest possible age, which obviously led to some wild, wild adventures. So what inspired you then to um, decide to plan the trip to solo around the world? At this point in time, and, and like I'm pretty old um, <laughs> in comparison to other guys who've done this, uh, Barrington Urban broke the record. Uh, an American gentleman broke the record, I think back in 2008, the age record for the youngest person to fly solo around the world prior to that was around 37. So there really wasn't much of an age record. Barrington broke it at 23. 
Uh, I was a normal Aussie kid anymore, you know, laid back. I'd be lying down. I was 17. He was 23. Uh, I wasn't very good at math, but I knew I had six years if I was to break the record to make this happen. And I'd seen an article. It was simple as that on Barrington's trip. And I just, I was blown away. Blown away, not by all the fanfare at all. That didn't interest me, but by the fact that there was still a record to be broken. There was still a potential for an aviation first in the modern day world. And it seemed to me that that era had gone by as a kid who read books on Charles Lindbergh and, you know, Sir Charles Kingsley Smith and all these incredible pioneering aviators. So it's just a matter of uh, reading that article, uh, falling in love with the idea of the adventure, the exploration, um, even a little bit of the risk, I suppose, and you know, all the elements of a good adventure. Uh, and then deciding, all right, I want to have a crack at this. How can I pursue it? Um, that thought started this crazy, especially as a normal kid in a normal family, started this crazy two-year process of not just planning and training, preparing as a pilot, but fundraising, you know, pulling together a, an, an, an expedition that you know, had so much red tape attached to it and so many issues from like a financial standpoint well outside of the realm of a pilot. So a pretty wild, transformative two years for a normal family to pull off something that was far from normal. So what kind of planning went into it? How did you put it all together? Funding, all of that. Um, we know obviously it's a lot of work. So how did you do that at such a young age? Who helped you? I think at this point, no one really knew what I wanted to do. You know, it's a bit easier for, you know, the more recent troops because they can turn around and say, Round the world flights in single engine aircraft now are becoming more common and common, but it's only in the last really 10 years that it's become, you know, this common and this frequent. So I didn't really have many examples to compare to. So when I went out to try and pitch, you know, the first ever sponsorship deal, it was a website or, you know, in the end, we raised a quarter of a million dollars in, you know, not only cash, but goods, services, you know, it was a, it was hard to make people believe in what you were doing. Uh, but we spent two solid years uh, contacting companies all. We raised all of that quarter million dollars on a MacBook Air uh, laptop computer. And we really did it from the ground up. We networked, we built a team. We found people high up in the Australian industry who believed in not only what I was doing, but more importantly, believed in me and my ability as a young guy to do this and do it safely. And we, gosh, the first time, I didn't even tell my parents for the first four months that I wanted to do this. In fact, I Googled how to fly solo around the world and I found a website called earthrounders.com and, and that was my chance to read a little bit about it. I printed off all of the information on flying around the world and I highlighted all the important parts and I put it in my desk. I actually hid it because I didn't want any of my family to know that this was something I wanted to achieve. Uh, but the time come where I'd read all the information that was readily available and I needed to take it a step further. And at this stage, I'm 17 years old and just finishing high school. So I decided I wanted to contact one of the most famous Australian uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen, political figures, and aviation adventurers uh, that's ever, ever been. Uh, his name's Dick Smith, five-time around the world pilot, the first person to ever fly a helicopter solo around the world. So I decided I'd contact Dick Smith, but how do you do that as a 17-year-old kid? Well, I Googled his email address. Uh, which he hates me telling anyone. And I sent an email to all five email addresses mm -hmm. saying, hey, Dick, will you support me? This is what I want to do. You know, this is who I am. I have 250 hours and you know, I want to fly around the world. And he sent an email back that said, basically what you want to do is, you know, it's never been done before at your age. It's expensive. It's very dangerous. There's so much that goes into it. But at the end of the email, he gave me five words and that was truly all that mattered. He said, but it can be done. And from that point on, I went on to find a mentor. I had both Dick Smith and my mentor on my team. Before I went to my mum and dad, I showed them all the emails from Dick Smith. Uh, that showed them how serious this was. And that's what started this two years. Uh, we fundraised cash. We fundraised uh, goods in the way of immersion suits and all the equipment we needed from life rafts to uh, HF radios to bladder ferry tanks to go in the aircraft. And most importantly of all, we sourced an aeroplane, which was one of the hardest things I've ever done to 
to convince someone at 17 years old that they should give you their their single engine airplane to fly solo around the world but we managed to do that we we found a 2009 cirrus uh, sr22 uh, non-turbo and we rented that aircraft uh, covered the insurance uh, we did a dry hire to fly that aircraft solo around the world so uh, a wild two years so clearly your parents instilled a lot of good work ethic in you at a young age if you knew how to do all that planning and come to them pretty much with the proposal already set to go so you wouldn't leave any any reason for them to say no to you. So how do you feel like that has um, helped you uh, finishing um, that and also in your everyday professional life now? Well, I think a lot of it was a lot of who I who I was come from my parents, as you say, you know, my upbringing and my family. I really do have an incredible family, but I'm a really big advocate for young people learning to fly and self-funding it through school as opposed to going and taking a loan program out and putting themselves in lots of student debt in order to get a pilot's license. I think the you know hour per week or hour per every two weeks, depending on what you can afford, is a much more enjoyable process. It allows you to meet a lot of incredible people. It allows you to learn you know, work ethic and savings and goal setting and all of this good stuff. It allows you to network with a lot of older people in the industry who then respect you and allow you to fly their airplanes and do all this good stuff. It, it's just a really unbelievable journey. And I think from, from 14 years old through to 17, the relationship I built you know, with my local aero club and the lessons that I learned as a kid you know, basically saving every penny in order to be able to learn to fly uh, really changed my life and, and set me up to be able to take on the round the world flight. In fact, I was given an AOPA scholarship uh, when I was 16 years old. So I'd paid for hour lessons at a time up until this point. I was washing dishes at a restaurant, working at a supermarket when I was getting to the end of my training for my private license. I had to do some navigation flights. So now I was looking at larger chunks of money at a time and it was pretty scary because I didn't have that amount of money. I was going to have to stop flying and set to save it up. Uh, I had to buy my first car. All of these things were kind of adult life was creeping in and AOPA awarded me a scholarship that honestly helped me finish the last of my training. So that, that scholarship came as a result of the hard work I put in from 14 through and, you know, it, I really, appreciate those years of having to to work hard to you know get to where I could fly an airplane and, and that's why I value it so much so it really did set me up along with my family for the round the world flight and I mean it, it in itself that 70 day trip 24,000 miles it was just it was transformative to say the least I would never do it again <laughs> um so and then you ended up writing a book about that so how did that go it was good. So, you know, I, I'm just a normal Aussie kid again. Like I read airplane magazines in my English class, so I'm not the candidate to write a book, but um, my name can tell you every page number of every spelling mistake in that entire book. So, and that's not a joke. Um, the round the world flight was 24,000 nautical miles, 35 stops in 15 countries. The shortest leg was 20 minutes. The longest leg was 15 hours nonstop from Hawaii to California. Um, I was a 500, I was about 450 hour pilot when I departed. And, and I, my advice to you is if you want to go and do it is to have more than I did. Um, it was a baptism by fire a little bit in some areas, 60,000 foot thunderstorms in the, um, you know, tropical convergence zone, icing over the North Atlantic, you know, all sorts of issues. But I was able to succeed, not from a pilot point of view, but a team point of view. And Every time we deliver a keynote, I say, we took off and we landed and we did this. And, and everyone always says, weren't you on your own? I said, well, yes, but this was a team effort. The book was my way to thank all of those team members and to tell them every little bit of what I experienced because of their help in detail. I didn't have the time of day in the rest of my life. I couldn't sit down with everyone who had helped me and tell them what happened. Uh, but I really thought they deserved to know. So Born to Fly was our opportunity to share all the little details that could be easily forgotten with an incredibly huge 
audience and and the way it spread the way it inspired young people to you know to to find a job and to learn to fly was pretty powerful so i was really grateful for the opportunity to put it together um have so other people that have attempted this after you um and not only attempted but also completed have they reached out to you and what advice did you give to them i know trevor's working on this now um have you talked to him and and how is it it's like a cool little club do you guys have <laughs> meetings or what did and what advice did you give to other people that did this after you um there were so i pretty much have heard from everyone who who has attempted around the world flies solo at a young age after I did it. And, you know, I mean, good on them because I think you, you've got to learn from those who've done it before you, like you have to, at the end of the day, you forget all the good stuff that happens um, as a result of, you know, flying around the world, you have to be doing it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a free Breitling watch is not the right reason to fly around the world and being on social media or having any, news stories published that is not the right reason you've got to do it purely from an adventure sense you've got to want to do it because i tell you what it's a long way around you know and it's a lot of risk and a lot of stress that you're putting not only on yourself but your family and friends and the team behind you and all of your sponsors so you've got to be the right person for the job i've probably had 500 emails uh, since i finished my flight of people wanting to fly around the world and i've helped probably three uh, you know, make sure they can successfully complete it because everyone else, I don't believe, were, were doing it for the right reasons. Being an early flight, you know, one of the first ones, we had incredible media. We had 60 Minutes and we had, you know, all sorts of TV and print and all this other stuff and lots of awards and crazy experiences, meeting the royals, all this stuff come from the back of the round the world flight. A lot of people saw that and they were drawn to the cool stuff as opposed to the actual adventure. and. Um, you know, I think that creates a bit of a false sense of the fact that it's easy when it's not. And we have um, a father and a son that I know uh, were lost on a round the world flight. And I remember sitting down for a TV interview on an Australian Today show, the morning show. And it was the same day that they were lost coming out of Pango Pango. And I remember thinking they're going to ask me about this. And they did on, on live TV, just straight out asked me. And I'd spoken to them and, you know, same deal, giving them the tips and the tricks. So great adventure to go and do, extraordinary, changed my life. Um, but you have to be, one, do it for the right reasons and two, understand that it's a big undertaking and it is risky. Uh, so, you know, make sure that, you know, you understand all of the elements before you decide to uh, find media or tell people or set out. So. So um, obviously this was the peak of your aviation career up until what you had done. Um, And then fast forward, do you want to share with people what most people would probably say is the low of your aviation career? Oh yeah, without doubt. Yeah. Um, So my life was good. You know, I was a normal kid again, you know, doing things like meeting the Royals and being named one of Australia's 50 greatest explorers and, I was literally sitting at home with my family laughing that this was the journey that we were on, you know, and that this is where my life had gone. It was all just a fun experience. Um, My life was great. Uh, I decided to turn down an offer uh, off the back of the round the world flight and a speaking engagement to take my dream job with Qantas, which was my airline of choice when I was six years old. I decided to turn down that job flying Q400s and I just went, you know what? I don't want to do that yet. I'm too young. I don't want to be an airline pilot. I want to go and fly warbirds. My dream was to fly Spitfire. And I thought I need to go and get the tail wheel time and the stick and rudder time. And I want to build up that experience of real flying before I end up, you know, driving the bus. And that led me to a job where I was flying a bunch of old airplanes, one of which was a 1930s uh, vintage biplane, a, a British Tiger Moth. And these aircraft were a trainer back in the war. And I'd always dreamed of flying a tiger, and especially a yellow one. And I ended up flying a yellow tiger moth. And the job was simple, you know, take off from this grass airstrip, fly down, you know, get set up on the coastline, fly the coast of uh, Australia, look at the beaches, take one passenger uh, at a time for a ride in this two-seat aircraft. And 
you know, we'd come back and if they uh, were that way inclined, we'd do some loops and, you know, show some basic aerobatics and then we'd, we'd land and we'd do it again. And it was an incredibly satisfying job. On the 28th of December, 2015, I went to work just a normal day. I was um, a few weeks shy of turning 22. I climbed into the tiger. I hand propped it. I had a gentleman in the front who was an incredibly nice man. Uh, he was also a pilot. We talked for an hour or so before the flight. We jumped in early morning and we took off. There was no records to break, no oceans to cross, none of that. And we took off on the cross strip, a uh, short grass field. And as we uh, become airborne, the runway uh, end disappeared underneath the nose and we had an engine failure, uh, what we believe was a, a mostly partial engine failure. And we were at maybe 150 feet uh, on departure. What happened after that, nose down, three seconds, it was all over. And despite what I did in you know, the best of my abilities and training, it wasn't enough. And what resulted was a horrific accident above horrific terrain. It was just, it was just horror uh, to the point where I was cut out of the aeroplane once we were found by emergency services. I was flown to hospital, but I was the only survivor. In a split second moment, everything had changed. You know, I had survived an accident and the, the gentleman in with me had not. You know, we had had an engine failure where if we had had that failure a little bit earlier, 10 seconds earlier, we would have been okay. 20 seconds later, we would have been okay. But right where it happened, I just don't know what I could have ever done differently. I was taken to hospital and I had five breaks in my back, shattered facial bone, shattered ankle. I was messed up phenomenally from head to toe. They operated on me immediately, filled me with metal, and I woke up in a recovery ward with uh, no movement or feeling from my waist down, from L1 down. Uh, I'd had a spinal cord injury during the accident and I was a complete paraplegic. Um, it was just, I was at mental capacity. You know, the very... Uh, the very passion that I'd had since I was six that gave me my identity and had provided all the highs in my life, all the adventures and all the, it was just who I was as a person, you know, and it, it had been also the very thing that had now taken it all away. And what followed from that point on was, you know, it was definitely a physical journey, um, but it was more a mental journey and it was a battle, to be honest. Uh, almost six months in hospital, a year and a half in rehabilitation, a journey not just back to walking, but back to flying. And it was tough. You know, my life had changed. And that was, without doubt, the absolute lowest of the low for me. And since then, it's been four and a half years, uh, nearly five years. It has been about not only finding my way back into the air and adapting you know, through all the, the permanent damage that I have and always will have, but finding a way to take what happened that day and, and turn it into something that can actually benefit others. And, and that's, I mean, that's what we're doing. That's why I'm here. And, and, you know, it's, it's been a journey. So. so how, how do you move on from that? How do you keep going? Like, obviously you're so young still, 22 is still very young to have already accomplished everything you had by that time so how, how do you move on from that and and especially getting back to flying getting back to flying was never a question you know that was and i get asked that as you can imagine all all day every day by different audience members they you know how could you ever get back in an airplane well the truth is the first time i ever got out of that hospital i had my band on my wrist to you know if, in case i ran away uh, I was in my wheelchair and I had my crutches over my knee and a bag of clothes. And I left my mum and my family at the hospital. I said, I'll see you later. And I went, I honestly got in a cab and I went to the Sydney train station. I got on a train, went an hour north, got off the train in the middle of the night in my wheelchair, never been independent or on my own with a spinal cord injury. And I, I got off, everyone helped me with the wheelchair. I got off the, the train, I got onto a bus. I went another hour north. And I met up with the company that I was flying for when I had the accident and they lifted me up and they put me in a T28 Trojan and I didn't care what it was, uh, as long as it wasn't a Tiger Moth, I just wanted to be in an aeroplane. 
and I wanted to fly again. And I sat in the back of that Trojan and, and we took off and we flew down to an air show that happened to be at the airport that I had departed from and landed from uh, during my round the world flight. That was the, that was the departure and arrival point. So I found my way back into an airplane pretty quickly. I obviously being built a wheelchair was told that I would never walk again, but uh, throughout a really long, hard slog through rehabilitation, we started to see, you know, a twitch of a toe, a little bit of sensation come back, a, you know, twitch of a muscle. And I was so unbelievably lucky and through hard work to gain back enough to be able to walk. I look like I've had way too many Jack Daniels uh, whiskeys, but I, I'm walking. Um, from a permanent damage point of view, lots of things, you know, in ter- systems, bladder and all the feeling on the back of my legs, where I sit, my feet don't work really at all. Um, I've got no push in my feet. I can't use toe brakes anymore in any aircraft. Um, I just, no calf muscles, no glute muscles, lots of things wrong. But at the end of the day, I can walk, I can fly aircraft, uh, fixed wing with hand brakes and heel brakes. Uh, hence why I ended up with Dub the Cub. And not only that, but I went on after uh, I'd managed to fight my way and get a medical and get back into fixed wing flying, I went on to, as an incomplete paraplegic, uh, in six weeks, go from never having flown a helicopter to commercial helicopter license. Uh, you know, it was just lucky. I, I couldn't push the toe brakes. I didn't have enough strength in my feet to do that, but I did have enough strength to operate helicopter pedals, and uh, I was able to to become a commercial helicopter pilot. So, as for moving on, I, I, my life will never be the same, and I will never be able to move on from that. You know, I'm reminded every single day the way I move, the way I the way my life is, the way I operate uh, is, is a direct result of that day. Uh, but it's all about looking at it and saying, okay, well, how can I help others? And, and my, my hashtag, my saying, my mantra, my motto is turbulence tough. You know, how can we help other people be turbulence tough? How can we, you know, we all go through turbulence. We all go through the bumps in our life. This is just part of it. I mean, 2020 is, is you know, the very definition of turbulence, you know, what tools, tips, tricks, mindsets, ways of thinking do we need as a human to be able to get through the adversity and all this rough stuff that, that we just experience simply as a byproduct of being human. So my passion is still flying. I absolutely love it. Um, you know, I always will. I have goals. I still, still want to fly a Spitfire, but, uh, you know, my other passion then lies in, in keynote speaking and, and sharing a message and, you know, encouraging every kid I come across uh, that they really should be in the cockpit of an airplane. So before we get into your um, speaking work, I just want to ask, how do you view flying now as you do, like differently than before your accident? I, uh, I'm i very scared of uh, engine failures. And I think that's just natural. Um and that was a hard thing to deal with. I think when I had the accident, I off the back of the round the world flight was given an opportunity to purchase a, a Lancer 320. Uh, so we're talking a six gallon an hour, seven gallon an hour, 190 knot Taz rocket ship. And uh, her name was Lucy. We name all these airplanes. So Lucy the Lancer was an incredible machine. And uh, although I loved it and I owned it up to my accident after that engine fire, I sold it. Um, you know, and I understand, I understand the statistics, I understand the odds, I really do. But when you've been through what I've been through, I did not want to be in a machine that had the, the glide speed that the Lancer had. I did not ever want to be in that position again. I wanted something that was a little, little safer, uh, had a, a few more options. And I'd always wanted a yellow cub. So I ended up with a yellow 1952 Super Cub with 31 inch Alaskan bush wheels and He's become very affectionately known on Instagram as Doug, uh, Doug the Cub, named after Douglas Barter, the World War II double amputee Spitfire pilot. And that aircraft for me is absolutely just the epitome of fun flying. I've been lucky to ride in Mustangs and do all this other cool stuff just, you know, through circumstance. But when I get into that yellow Cub, you know, it's just, there's just nothing better. Bang for your buck, door open, you know, fall flying. I just, I love it. so. I am very wary of uh, the risk of flying. I, I was beforehand, but it's just a little different now for me. But at the end of the day, it's it's such a huge part of me and, and a passion that, you know, I'll never not 
be in the cockpit of a, an airplane or a helicopter or or anything like that. So, well, I think uh, all the cup owners uh, agree with you, and you you have a, a good support <laughs> system there. Um, so let's get into. Um, you mentioned your um, motivational speaking. Obviously, you have enough life experience in your short life because you are still very young um, to <laughs> to inspire people. So tell us a little bit about. Um, how that happened, what made you think of doing that and, and what you're doing with it? Absolutely. So after the round the world flight, I was asked just to rock up to events and tell my story. And I didn't really want to do it, to be honest. I just wanted to go fly. You know, I'd rather spend, you know, my days in an old chieftain, you know, trying to build twin time than I would, you know, being paid a lot more to then be on a stage and, and speak, you know, a, a passion was truly still within aviation. Uh, but that opportunity to stand on a stage really grew on me uh, to share a story and to watch an audience transform as you share your real life experiences. Not a textbook, not, you know, not something they read on the internet or saw on a YouTube video, but real life stories in the moment, in the room, you know, was really, really cool. And I fell in love with it, to be honest. Um, when I was flying the helicopter, so I'd, I'd been through the accident, I'd spoken right up to the accident, I'd, I'd been through six months in hospital, year and a half in rehabilitation, I'd, I'd found my way back to flying uh, fixed wing aircraft, specifically Doug. Um, I had ended up in the helicopters. I was flying the helicopter one day, determined to go on and be a firebombing pilot, uh, a little bit naive about how bad my injuries were and how restricted I was physically, but really determined to go and be a firebombing pilot in the rotary world. I was flying the helicopter one day, I landed, and I was actually on my way to the grocery store, and I thought, my my foot feels funny when that was a bit odd because I can't feel my feet. I took off my shoe and it was full of blood. And what had happened is I'd had a, a large rock in my shoe and I couldn't feel it. And I'd flown all day with the heli uh, in a helicopter with the rock in my shoe and it had eaten into my foot. So that put me back in hospital and back into the wheelchair for two months. And uh, as that healed, I really sat back and thought about life and what I wanted to do. And I thought, you know what? I think I need to go speaking. You know, I really need to build a business in the US and and share my story with everyone from school groups through to corporate America, associations, non for profits, everyone. You know, we have so much. It, we there's a lot of adversity speakers out there. You know, people who've had a bad day and they talk about the climb back. And then there's a lot of speakers out there who talk about adventure and climbing mountains and crossing oceans by air, by sea. You know, and that's all fantastic. But I realized as a young guy. At 21, I'd been given both. And although I didn't see it then, it was actually an opportunity to compare the highs in life and then the lows in life and and then ask myself, where do we truly learn? Like, where do we become the strongest? Where does Ryan learn the tough tools that he needs to move on through life? Is it in the highs or is it in the lows? And, you know, that was a really cool um, moment for me to realize that I needed to go out and, and talk about that. So. I am here in the US and, and that's exactly what we do. You know, we, we speak to large and small organizations and we talk about being turbulent staff. We talk about, you know, a three-step checklist of navigating change. We dive into into detail in the stories of the round the world flight and all the different ups and downs of that journey. And we talk about that moment of change and ending up at the bottom and and not only in in spinal ward with a paraplegic diagnosis, but as the only survivor of a plane wreck. Yeah, how do you deal with that as a pilot? You know that's about as rough as it gets in in my eyes and you know we talk about that climb back that sink or swim mentality and it's been you know i'm not a tony robbins guy like i'm not a stand up high five the guy next to you telling me he has good eyebrows like that just i'm an aussie dude i i just i'm so laid back uh, so we really lean on good old aussie storytelling around the campfire chatter uh, to help others understand that their challenges their rough days their turbulent times it's not unique to them, you know, and there's a lot of other people out there who've managed to get their way through it. And there's a lot of people who are willing to share and help and mentor and, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of lead them through it. So. so what are some of your tips for motivating people? Um, especially after everything you've experienced. I think one thing we're delivering virtually this year, a lot is what we call a three-step checklist and navigating change. And, what we see, we talk about a mindset toolbox approach, how every lesson that we, every moment that we have in life, we really should actually grab hold of that, 
you know, sit down on our own, unpack it, think about what did we actually learn it, not what did we learn from a surface level, just, you know, brushing over that moment and then forgetting about it. What do we really learn? Unpack it, think about it, pull all the tools that we learned with that person. It might be a, a conversation with your grandfather or it might be, you know, a chat over lunch with your flight instructor whilst you're on a navigation exercise. It might be, you know, something that you saw on TV or whatever. Unpack these moments in life, these easily forgettable moments. Basically convert them to tools and place them in your own mindset toolbox, a, a toolbox that you take with you everywhere you go, you know, a, a, a drawer that's accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we talk about this mindset toolbox concept in detail, how to find tools, how to use them, when to use them, how to keep them sharp. But this year, I think what's important to understand is you can have a full toolbox and I'm lucky to have a full toolbox, uh, you know, with so many mentors and people around me and having been through so much. When 2020 hits and crisis hits, even with the full toolbox, it's hard to know which tool to grab out. It's hard to know what we should be doing today to get through, you know, to next week, next month, next year. We come up with a really simple checklist. And when I speak to a lot of groups, they're not aviation groups, they're not pilots. So I explain how within aviation, we use a checklist. A pilot has a checklist for that aircraft, a list of potential predetermined problems and when something goes wrong, or, you know, a red light flashes or a warning buzzer sounds, the pilot doesn't just start pressing random buttons and pulling random levers, you know, despite what you see in Hollywood. A pilot uses a systematic approach to working through the problem, run through that checklist, hopefully end up at a potential solution. So we created a checklist not for an aeroplane, but for life. And it's a three-step checklist to navigating change. It's finding gratitude, confidence, and resilience every time you come up against a problem right before you start to climb that mountain. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be doing the washing and getting the kids to school. It could be being told that you have cancer. It, could, it doesn't matter how big or how small, it's finding gratitude, thankfulness uh, for the state that you're in. It's always something to be thankful for and it shrinks that mountain before we even climb it. Once you've found gratitude, you find confidence and confidence is we have to have confidence in our ability to get through what we're up against, right? From here to that journey to the resolution, solution, or end goal. To find confidence, we must lock in the next step. We want to know every step. We want to know how it'll play out. We want to know when 2020 will be over. And we want to know, most importantly, whether Oshkosh will be on next year. But <laughs> we don't know that stuff. That just doesn't work. That's not how life works. You know, it, it wasn't when I was on leg three of the around the world flight. I didn't know what was going to happen in Greece. When I was diagnosed and placed into hospital and I was learning to roll over, I never knew whether I'd walk. It's all about one step at a time. So zoom out, look at the big picture, where you are, where you want to be, zoom back in and just get to work on that, that next job. Uh, once you've done that, that's gratitude, confidence, it's resilience. Life sucks sometimes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry to be blunt, but there is no golden nugget that's going to make your life easy. I tell everyone that. If I knew that golden nugget, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be on my yacht in some <laughs> island drinking margaritas. You know, life's tough. And the journey from here onwards is going to be riddled with challenges and adversity. That's just a byproduct of breathing. So we have to be resilient, right? How do we do that? We do it through anticipating the need to adapt. So it's by looking ahead at that journey, like, all right, there are going to be things we're going to have to jump left and right around. That's just life. And by looking forward and starting to anticipate them, think about what may come your way and how you may get around them. When those moments rock up at your doorstep, you're not in shock. And that's the biggest fact that affects us is, you know, we don't want to be in shock because we can't think straight. So if we remove the shock value, all of a sudden we're in control. And by doing that, what we're actually doing is taking those moments of adversity, those obstacles and challenges, and we make them part of the process. And it just makes it so much easier. Every time we come up against a problem this year, every, you know, next year, the year after, find gratitude, confidence and resilience. A really quick three-step checklist. It takes you two minutes and you're going to feel so much better. It doesn't solve your problems. It puts you in a more change and challenge ready mindset. So that's my tip, uh, my quick tip to a lot of people. But, you know, we love it, it's so interesting to dive into the checklist, you know, really, really deep to talk about the mindset toolbox, to talk about all the takeaways that not only did I learn throughout my wild life to date, but what I've learned as a byproduct of being around others, being around a quadriplegic named Ben or a businessman named Andrew or a paraplegic 
named Eric. You know, we tell these stories of other incredible humans, uh, the humans that have given me strength, and now I have the opportunity to pass that strength on to other people. So, yeah, that, I won't bore you anymore, but that um, that's what we do day to day. Well, we, we could talk all day, I feel like, um, and you're definitely wise beyond your years. Let's see. Um, I just want to ask you some fun questions. Like where, now that you're in the U.S., where do you like um, flying to the most? I discovered, so when I moved here, I flew uh, from Kyle Bushman's Ragwood Refactory up in, uh, he put Doug together and we worked for 10 days to get Doug, uh, you know, not just put back together, but we gave him a bit of a birthday. So I flew the airplane uh, from Oregon back to Nashville. I went through the Pady's house and, you know, I stayed there and I was living this wild kind of YouTube dream and I ended up back here. So that flight was incredible. I then took the Cub and I flew across to Nevada uh, to High Sierra, Kevin Quinn's High Sierra flying, which I think is just one of the greatest things on the planet. And it took me 65 hours to get there, fly around with my buddies and fly home, which is why I need a Cirrus and not a Cub. But uh, that was an incredible adventure. But honestly, I think when it comes to calming your stressful day, this is the best thing in the whole wide world is to take off out of our little airport here and just be in the air for 20 minutes, fly around the barns and the silos and the trees and the fields and watch the sunset and then zoom back in and land. That is, that's just my favorite thing to do. So I know that your speaking from home has allowed you to have some cool gadgets on the screen. What kind of <laughs> stuff um, do you get to use from home now that you're not um, on a stage and things like that? Why don't we give the audience some of that before we let you go? <laughs> We do. So I'll, uh, we have all sorts of clips and fun stuff that we use in virtual presentations, but this would not be an AOPA call if I didn't introduce you to Doug. So um, <laughs> this is Doug. He's a 1952 Super Cub. Uh, it's got no 320, 160 horse. I, no one else cares when I talk to a group who's a financial, you know, a, fin a finance group or a, you know, a, a, a gas stain, uh, chain store or whatever. They don't care about this stuff, but I know your uh, listeners do. So he's a 160 horsepower Super Cub and you know, 31 inch bush wheels. It's got uh, TK shocks on there and it's just an absolute beast of an airplane. So um, I love him to bits. It's just that cub will be part of my life forever and ever. So um, we use uh, overlaid footage and, and all sorts of different content just to kind of bring uh, people, I don't know, just kind of make their Zoom call a little less Zoom call because I think we're all worn out. So this is the book Born to Fly. Um, all the little funny moments in life, meeting Prince William, uh, Prince William when I didn't have a beard and I was much skinnier. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, we try to, to create a little bit of a fun adventure for everyone. So. That's exciting. Um, so before we let you go, what, um, there is a lot obviously out there on you. Is there anything you can tell the audience that maybe nobody knows about you? <laughs> Some people may know this on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, jump on and you can follow me at Ryan Campbell speaking, but Oh gosh, I'm going to tell you three things really quickly. So I always show these two photos. I, ne I don't know why I'm showing you these, but this is a photo of me when I was a small child and I had the biggest head in the world. I understand that. But what I'm wearing in Australia is what we would call a skivvy. And on that skivvy is a bunch of airplanes. So I always say from that point on, I was destined to be, you know, <laughs> I, I was destined to be in the air. But the first time I ever went to America, uh, this photo was taken and we have all these people who wonder whether my head ever shrunk and you see this photo and you realize that absolutely not. It did not <laughs> shrink at all. This is the first ever time that I ate White Castle. Also the last ever time that I'll ever eat White Castle. But one thing that people do not know is, you know, on Instagram, we have Doug and we have Flo. And these are my kids, by the way. Uh, when I moved to America, where is it? Oh, it's up the back. You can't really see it. But right there is a model car. And I bought that at Graceland where Elvis, uh, obviously Elvis's place in Memphis. So I w I've always wanted to own a pink Cadillac. So I went to uh, Graceland. I bought this model and my housemate at the time said to me, what are you doing with that? I said, well, I've always wanted a pink Cadillac and now I finally have one. And I sat it next to my TV and I said, I'm going to keep this one until I get the real thing one day when I'm old. And somehow in the next year, this popped up on Facebook. And for some reason I bought it. I'm not sure why, but this is Flo. Uh, a 1960 pink <laughs> Cadillac. So one, one thing people don't know about me is that I own a 1960 pink car 
And as you can see in the photo, this is all that happens. You, you literally just have people sitting in it, taking photos with it. You have to be social to be out in the caddy. So I've got a lot of pilot buddies who've flown into Nashville and we, uh, we jump in flow and we lap around and, you know, watch people smile and wave and honk their horn and do all sorts of cool stuff with the car. So um, that's a little known fact about me. That's pretty exciting. I definitely want to ride in it one day. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever <laughs> been in a pink car. <laughs> Um, well, Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with us. Um, your story is very inspiring. And do you want to tell people where they can find you on the internet and social media? Absolutely. Um, so we're on Instagram mainly at Ryan Campbell speaking. We're on LinkedIn or all sorts of good stuff. But you can find all of that at the website. And that's www.ryancampbell.co. It's not .com. I cannot afford the M yet. It's ryancampbell.co. Uh, so you can jump on there, links to everything, send me an email, give me a call. We'd, um, if we can help with a virtual event or if we can help with a keynote, you know, we just, we'd love to be there and love to share some stories. So we really uh, appreciate you having uh, me on. Awesome. Thank you. And I do hope that we get to see you at some aviation events in 2021. Doug and I will be there. I promise. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. See ya.